Good morning. My Haida name is K.L. Juice, and my English name is Barbara Wilson. And I thank you for inviting us. And I'd like to acknowledge the, the people on whose land we stand on. And in Canada, we, we do it as a regular part of acknowledging where we stand. Because in Canada, especially in British Columbia, the land is unceded. So today we're going to give you a presentation on navigating the return of sea otters and looking at what we've learned since 2013 as we've actively been involved with the nations in Canada. Some of them are also in this part of the um, United States through um, moving back and forth. As we look at this, I want you to know that there are many people who were involved, not just Anne and I. I want to acknowledge the steering committee of the hereditary chiefs and knowledgeable knowledge holders, and I want to um, acknowledge Simon Fraser University, uh, the Pew Foundation, and Hicks, as they've helped us in our funding. And you can see where people who we've been involved with, where they've lived, and it goes through the whole post. So you see Barb and, up, uh, Barb and I are up here together, and it's because much of the work that we do together, we integrate Western science, um, indigenous knowledge, ethnographies, archaeological data to get a fuller picture to understand the interactions between humans and sea lives. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to start off by describing the challenge that we all have ahead of us. And to do that, we're going to take a dive into deep time first, and we're going to go into deep time and recent history and describe why it is we see the legacy of the challenge ahead of us that we do. We're also going to introduce some key concepts and terms, some of which may be very familiar to some of you, less familiar to others. So we'll be talking about keystone species and hyper keystone species. I noticed a few eyes, like, oh, hyper keystone. Maybe that is new for some of you. With that background, we're then going to dive into the data. We will dive into the evidence for the direct effects of otters and the indirect effects of otters on kelp forest food webs. We'll then talk about our work collecting information on ancient use and stewardship of otters and what people are identifying as enabling factors that help them adapt to sea otters today in Alaska and British Columbia. And then we're going to end off with some what we call sticking points because we couldn't figure out a better term. Um, they're basically adding to the challenge and that is human-induced climate change today and the duality of laws and equity and justice something that is outside the realm of the typical marine ecologist, but is really where the rubber hits the road when it comes to the recovery of sea otters. Okay. So, kill Yahka is about law. It's about ancient law that we've learned as we've lived on the land since it was light yet dark. Archaeological evidence and stories, ethnographies, all tell us that humans have lived on our coastline for at least 14,000 years, if not more. And this kelp highway hypothesis that was put forth um, by John Erlinson and others suggests that it was coastal ecosystems like kelp forests that sustained some of the earliest coastal migration routes of maritime people to the Americas. So that what that means is that humans have been interacting with coastal ecosystems like these, like this kelp forest off the coast of Haida Gwaii, where Barb is from, for millennia, for thousands of years. They've been interacting with it, exploiting it, learning and experimenting, and conserving and managing these systems for a long time. And of course, that changed dramatically, like you said, with a blink of the eye. Had a nice turn of phrase there, Robert. With the arrival of Europeans, and that happened, of course, first in 1741 in Alaska, and then in 1774 
in British Columbia to Haida Gwaii, later 1778, by the famous Cook Expedition. So dramatic transformations occurred to this entire system. Many of you know that with the recover or with the, the Europeans coming came the rapid depletion of sea otters. In less than half an hour, we'd purchased 300 of the finest pelts we'd ever seen. So the depletion of sea otters happened very quickly. So did profound ecological change. This is a quote from uh, George Dawson in 1878. Below the high water mark in some places, the large urchins are very thickly strewn over the bottom. Sea otters were probably ecologically extirpated by the early 1800s, 1830s or so. And so we saw dramatic changes in the seafloor, and probably that's when some of the earliest ecological changes happen. And many of you know this story, but many of you might not know this accompanying story. When the, <clears throat> excuse me, when the sea otters were extirpated, what happened to the people was that our, the trade routes and they came down through um, what's now called the United States down as far as we believe uh, Mexico and farther south. Those trade networks were, were disrupted um, due to laws and inability to travel, sickness, death. And the marine tenure systems also were impacted because of laws. And so there were all these cascading things that happened to people who lived uh, with, the, with nature, or, uh, as part of nature, for so long. And so our resource management, um, the principles we lived by, the protocols and the practices that we, we used to ensure that there was balance in our world uh, was severely interrupted with the inability to move freely and, and look after the parts of the world that we recognized as our, our traditional lands and the traditional uh, knowledge, we call it now, um, that we live with every day. So why these profound changes? Well, that's in part because sea otters and humans are keystone species. And Many of you may know, but some of you don't know what a keystone species is. So let's get some definitions down here. Um, what you're looking at is a photograph of Robert Payne who coined the term keystone species. He's pointing to the keystone in an arch. And many of you know that if you remove the keystone in the arch, the arch will crumble. So he used that as a metaphor. And he recognized the importance of metaphor um, back in 1969. And what he was describing was the impact that uh, individual species per capita or per individual species can have on a system. So what that means is that some species, even though they may have very low abundance, can have very, very high impact. Starfish are, are the, were some of his first um, earlier ecological muse and he also related to, to sea otters. So what happens when you remove a keystone species or add a keystone species? And another uh, ecological phenomena that Bob identified was this whole notion of a trophic cascade. And what you're looking at here is just a symbol of a trophic cascade in an ecosystem, or an abstraction, as Barb would say. Each sphere here represents relative biomass. So the bigger the sphere, the more biomass. The smaller the sphere, the, the smaller the biomass. And when you have top predators come into a system, you can cause these alternating patterns in biomass. And that's what's called a trophic cascade. And you can see this in this kind of simple food chain. The size of the arrow represents the strength of the interaction. So where you see a big arrow, you see a strong interaction, and a little thin arrow, a weak interaction. And that's what's causing that alternating pattern in biomass. But we also know that trophic cascades don't exist in a vacuum. They exist in complex food webs, represented here by these gray spheres. And we also recognize more and more these days that humans tend to be this dominant apex predator in systems. And so what we really want to remind you all here is that when you're thinking about trophic cascades induced by sea otters, think about humans and think beyond and what influences humans. Societal pressure, 
international and national markets, technology, culture, values, all of those influence human behavior and indirectly influence the occurrence and magnitude of trophic cascades we see in our seascapes and in our landscapes. It's been recognized recently by the um, identification of a new term, and that's this term hyperkeystone species, a term that was identified by several people and described in this paper here. What you're looking at are four different trophic cascades across different ecosystems. Ocean systems, this is the cascade we're here to talk about, elicited by the predator. You can see they occur across different habitats, intertidal systems, freshwater systems, <coughs> excuse me, and on land. And that little H up there, that stands for humans, because humans are usually altering the presence um, and distribution of those predators. And we do so at a very, very high per capita effect, and that makes us hyperkeystone species. So as we start looking at various parts of this, the big challenge is that we both have a right to food. Sea otter have a right to food, but so do humans. In, in these pictures, you see um, on the bottom, uh, one that the sea otter has what we call gunungai, and the picture on the on the right is my uncle, and he's he's opening open the gunungai or the sea urchin um, on a trip we were on together, uh, looking at um, what's happening to our islands. Okay, so now that we've got a bit of a foundation of um, the past, we're going to look to the present and the future and the um, direct and indirect effects of sea otters as keystones. And I'm going to do this by first introducing the pioneering work of Jim Estes, who was originally invited to give this talk, and he passed the torch to us. Um, Jim is a friend and colleague of ours, and I want to share some of, of his seminal work. So Jim in the 70s went to Alaska. And he made some really critical observations there that are important for everyone to know. In this map here, the blue line represents the historical range of sea otters. And as we've shared with our um, previous slides, that range was dramatically shrunk because of the maritime fur trade. But there were some remnant populations you see here in red and reintroduced, reintroduced populations in green here later on. So when Jim first went to the islands of Shimia and Amchatka, he made some critical observations. These islands were islands with and without otters. And his seminal work in 1974 showed that at islands without otters, you tend to see high densities and high biomass of sea urchins, a dominant reef grazer, a herbivore. On islands with sea otters, you tend to get high densities of kelp. This is a, the dragon kelp, Valeria fistulosa. And I think that's Paul Dayton who's scuba diving there. So what Jim documented at a very large geographical scale was the evidence of a trophic cascade, where islands that had sea otters, had very few um, sea urchins and very low biomass of urchins and a lot of kelp, and islands without otters had a lot of these herbivores and very little kelp. But Jim didn't stop there. He worked with many colleagues and students to um, identify the broader community and ecosystem level effects of this dramatic change that he saw over the seascape. Some of the first work he did with uh, collaborators, David Duggins, was to show something really important. And what they did is they transplanted tiny little mussels and barnacles on plates, little settling plates, on islands Sea otters were abundant in black and where sea otters were absent in gray. And they measured how fast these filter feeders grow. And remember, these filter feeders, they are using siphons, mussels using siphons, the barnacles are using their feet to collect particles in the water. They collect phytoplankton and little bits of kelp detritus, which is just bits of decaying kelp. And on islands where sea otters were abundant, 
muscles grew two to five times higher, faster, I should say, than on islands where there were no sea otters. And that's because <clears throat> of all of the kelp detritus in the water. It was also because in the Aleutian Islands, the water around there is um, it's kind of like a desert. Um, there's not as much nutrient and productivity, primary productivity, as your Oregon coast here. So if you add a little bit of kelp detritus to the system, you get greater growth. His colleagues also showed that the diet of various seabirds, including glaucous wing gulls, changed dramatically on these islands with and without otters. So you can see here for glaucous wing gulls on islands where sea otters are abundant, their diet was primarily composed of fish, minimally of invertebrates, and on islands where sea otters were absent in gray, there are very few fish in their diet and many more invertebrates. A pretty dramatic shift in what these birds are eating. Same thing for bald eagles. You can see a really different um, proportion of uh, different species in their diet, bird, mammals, and fish. Essentially, bald eagles that are uh, foraging over islands where otters are absent are consuming a lot more birds and a lot less fish. He also worked with a postdoc, um, Chris Wilmers, to identify the, the ecosystem services of sea otters. And so they did some back of the envelope cal calculations and identified from Alaska all the way down to the BC coast, what was the implications in terms of carbon storage? And in places where you have, when you have otters and you change the net primary production of the system, otters can um, facilitate or magnify carbon storage uh, by four to nine teragrams, valued between 205 and $408 million. And this is the work of Chris Wilmers and colleagues with Jim. So that's some of, of Jim's work that really has um, inspired myself, my lab, my students, and many probably people in the room here and others to explore these questions. And in British Columbia, when I started my job, um, having come from Alaska, I knew that it was important to ask these questions. Um, on the west coast of BC here, sea otters were reintroduced intentionally on the west coast of Vancouver Island in the late 60s, early 70s. And they've been expanding their range since. On the central coast, they were first observed and documented in 1989. And so my students and I have been exploring this gradient in sea otter occupation time to ask questions about tipping points in kelp forest systems. When do they change and to what degree do they change? And how, do that, how does that influence the whole system? I'm just going to give you some snippets now. So this is work by a student of mine, Leah Honka, that was looking at sea otter diet diversity at five different sites that vary in occupation time. So the site on your far left, otters had just recently occupied the site. They'd been there for literally two weeks before we started observing them. And then sites on your far right, they had been there for at least 33 years, if not longer. Okay. The different colors here represent different prey groups, but I'm going to get your eyes to look to the top graph first, and you're just looking at diversity of prey that they're putting in their mouth. You can see that the diversity of prey increases with the occupation time of sea otters, but by 33 years you can see how it dips down a little bit. Same thing with prey size. Prey size. Those are box and whisker grass, and if you look at that middle line there, that's the median and you can see that prey size declines with occupation time, and then this pops up a little bit after about 33 years. And when it comes to what they're putting in their mouths, they really start off focusing on the readily available prey. In our case in British Columbia, it's red sea urchins, followed by a diversity of other invertebrates, including abalone. In British Columbia, abalone are listed as an endangered species. It's the northern or pinto abalone. Clams crabs, and mussels. By the time otters have been around for a long time, they're starting to forage on smaller prey items and prey items that you find in the intertidal. These are California mussels that we have up in BC, just like you do here as well. Okay, this is work led by a student of mine, Jen Burt, and what you're looking at here are a whole bunch of different sites. The pink sites, no otters have been there for at least 150 years. The orange sites are those recently occupied sites I just mentioned. The green sites are sites that have been occupied for uh, at least 33 years. And we've been following sites not only across space, but through time. And you can see that in BC, 
switches happen very, very quickly. So this is urchin biomass. You can see how it's been depleted um, within about a year uh, with the recovery of sea otters just, just after we got there in 2013. And this is what it looks like underwater. So this is the exact same reef in 2013 and 2014. And in 2014, what you can see is far fewer urchins and the recovery of kelp. You're looking at bull kelp or neurocystis. This is one of the first annual species that comes into a system. After about 33 years, though, you see the evolution of kelp forests. You start to see old growth kelp forests. You don't often see as high densities of stipes or kelps, but you see these older perennial kelps, like pterogopher, that's what you're seeing in the back. And the seafloor almost looks like a coral reef, right? What you're looking at are bryozoans and hydroids and the presence of lots of fleshy algae there because the herb dominant herbivore sea urchins have been reduced to very low numbers or to cracks and crevices. That was a picture of the central coast. This is a picture off the coast of Haida Gwaii. And you see kelp around the fringes in the shallows. That's near cystis you're seeing. But down deep is where you start seeing the dramatic urchin barrens. So what do these shifts mean for other species? Inspired by some of Jim's work, we asked, do you tend to catch more fish in sites where you have high densities of otters? So you're looking at copper rockfish on one side and kelp greenling on another and different occupation times. And essentially, copper rockfish increase in catchable biomass when you've had otters around for a long time because of the expanse of habitat. It's not so for uh, kelp greenling. And some of Jim's work with his students has shown that rock greenling in Alaska, you also get higher catch rates where you have sea otters. So some species do well, some species do poorly. And this is one species that does poorly. This is the endangered northern abalone. Um, culturally very important species for the Haida and many nations up and down our coast. And this is the work led by a student of mine, Lynn, who looked at abalone densities off Haida Gwaii, where there's been no otters, the central coast, where there's been um, otters for about 30 years, about a thousand otters there, and the west coast of Vancouver Island, where there have been um, otters for at least 50 odd years, there are about 5,000 otters there. And what you can see is uh, high degree of variation within a site and among sites, but this kind of clear pattern of decrease when you have otters. But it's not just predation that controls the distribution and abundance of invertebrates. There are many other factors. What you're looking at here is abalone density as a function of otter occupation time in the upper left, wave exposure on your right, um, substrate complexity, and depth. You can see all of these factors influence the density and distribution of water, uh, abalone. But fundamentally, when you have otters return to a system, their densities of exposed abalone decrease by 16-fold, but cryptic hiding abalone increase by about two-fold. So here's why. What you're looking at is a depiction of what happens to kelp forests through time they get bigger from the surface, but they also get deeper underwater. And so abalone that are hanging out in the shallows, where otters have not existed for about 150 years, can then start marching down around their preferred habitat. So there are some indirect benefits of having otters around on abalone. They do cause a 16-fold decline, which is dramatic. Those numbers are pretty high because otters had not been around in the system for a long time. But they still do promote some uh, sustainable populations, we believe, of abalone because they can hide and because their food source is there. But it's a bit of an assumption that sea otters and kelp forests were everywhere in BC. So now we're going to get to our community work. Yep. So what we did was we looked at we looked at stories, we looked at um, archaeology. Um, we looked at uh, the various parts of, of the coast. And when we were looking at it, we uh, looked at uh, through the archaeologists and the historians and 
our old stories uh, we looked at where middens were sighted. But it was important for uh, me to point out that all these middens that are recognized along the coastline, um, they're not all, they haven't all been tested. So when you look at Haida Gwaii, for instance, where I come from, um, it's important to remember that uh, the the sites that are showing on the east coast of Haida Gwaii, um, they're funded usually by federal or provincial government. And the sites that are, are not shown on the west coast, that's not because there isn't uh, middens out there. It's because we didn't have money to do all the um, sites throughout the whole area, and it's probably the same thing throughout the coast, okay? So we um, looked at the uh, inclusion of, of sea otter bones and the percentages that were in the middens, and you can see from the different sizes and, and the X's where uh, there were large amounts of sea otters bones and it's indicative of, of a system where humans were readily a part of it and the use of, of sea otters not just for their, for their furs but also for their food value um, as ocean people because we ate the, the um, sea otters also. So these are the people that we worked with again and we went deliberately to these places um, on you, the stars you see where the stars are we started with the Supiak where Anne started her work many years ago and we had uh, Nick uh, Tanapi work with us and we went to the New Chalmers on the west coast of Vancouver Island and asked them if they wanted to get involved with an idea. We hadn't written all our things up already, but uh, we were very nervous. At least I was. I had nightmares about it. And uh, because we were told that they didn't like sea otters. So, but it was very important for us to have the local people involved because it, it very much affects uh, the food that they're, they have to eat uh, after sea otters have been reintroduced to an area. So I'd like to acknowledge the um, hereditary leaders who were our steering committee um, from Vancouver Island, from Central Coast, from Haida Gwaii, where we don't have sea otters back yet, but we were using these four different areas to look at the impact of sea otters as they come into the areas. And so um, as we look at them, uh, we, we know that we have a, a project, we have a goal that the hereditary leaders up and down the coast have, a, have endorsed and, and are standing with us as the steering committee. So we want to generate strategies and we have in some cases um, got a lot of um, re research done um, by the, the students of Anne and colleagues of mine. So we'll, we'll look at this as we go through the talk. So the first thing we did after we got the hereditary leaders online with us was to have an interdisciplinary workshop for four days uh, in Central Coast. And this is where the, after we'd been there, the uh, sea hunters showed up about a month later, and and the man who owned the place that we were at, he would say, no, no, there's no sea otters here. And then one morning he woke up and there was a raft of fifty in his <laughs> in his water. So he was he was quite overwhelmed. So this is the group of scientists and. Uh, knowledge holders in Himas or Lana Algalung or uh, Awith, our hereditary leaders, and the knowledge holders that we work with to start with. 
and some of the things we've done so far is we have a we have a, a internet uh, spot where we have coastal voices and it tells the different stories that we have secured from speaking with the different knowledge holders in the different areas so if you want to go there you could you could learn more about our projects we also did interviews in depth interviews while we were at the at the um, Akai Institute in Central Coast and we we did inter, um, interview the scientists as well as the knowledge holders and the HEMAs and we talked about use management stewardship and other parts that we felt were important um, when we looked at the um, who, which is the name of what we call our sea otters, is who. So we, we had a lot of the hereditary leaders talk to us about things they felt were really important in remembering um, what happens when sea otters come in to an area, especially if the First Nations are not included, because it, it, as I said earlier, it really impacts um, the way they can live uh, with their land, um, off the land, on the land, and all these different parts. And so as you make your choices and your decisions, I hope that the local people will be included in, in your deliberations because of the profound impact of, of sea otters and, and climate change is, is very significant. I'm just going to read this quote in case we didn't get to, to read it because you were enthralled by Barb, which I always am. So this is a quote from a chief of um, the Cayucat Chukasit Nation, which is the place where Seattle is re reintroduced to Vancouver Island in 1969 with acceptance. He says, the way our people did it in the past is that they kept sea otters away from where we were close by, like all around the islands, just out there. They hunted them there, they kept them off the sea urchin beds so that they, the people, didn't take, sorry, the, or sea, sea otters didn't take everything. It could be done again. So we heard various quotes by knowledge holders identifying the local control of sea otters to allow people access to food. And now I want to show you archaeological evidence for this. This is work by our dear colleague Ian McKechnie and my student Erin Slade, who have been digging through shell middens and they'd be looking for the umbo of California mussels. And from that, we can estimate the size of what people ate in the past, California mussels people ate in the past. So I want to show you the data here. In blue is the relative proportion, or you can think of it as a percent, this is a histogram, of mussels in the modern time, actually just a couple of years ago, in places with otters. In white, you see the histogram of mussels in the modern time with no otters. And you can see how there's a higher proportion of larger individuals, right? The tail goes out to the to your right. And in gray, you're looking at the sample from the shell midden. And you can see that the histogram in the gray looks a lot like the histogram in the white and not like the histogram in the blue. That's suggesting that at least 500 years ago in Tassat territory in this particular area, local people were harvesting the size of mussels that you would harvest today if otters were not close to your village. So this is just an, another line of evidence along with Peter, the chief that we just heard, suggesting that local people probably excluded sea otters close to their villages so they could access food because these keystone species can dramatically and quite quickly cause depletions and shellfish. Okay, so what 
what various other people have suggested, and we think that there's a lot of evidence for it, is that in the past we might have seen a spatial mosaic of kale forests and shellfish. So one of the things we did was we had someone come while we were doing uh, the highest percentage of our work, and they filmed the individuals we spoke with, and we made a documentary film out of it. And <clears throat> it's available uh, online. You can go to our site and, and find that also. But this is my brother. My brother is my hereditary chief. And you'll notice on the paddle, there's the, um, well, you can't see it that well, is the sea otter and the kelp. It's in, it's just what we know is going to happen up north uh, where I come from. So we also have a Facebook page, and you can go on there and you can listen to the different things or you can leave comments. And uh, we try to make it available to as many people as, as possible because we think it's really important because in Canada, we have SARA, Species at Risk Act, and it's very profound the impact it has on people when they can't manage their territories properly. So we took time and we went to Alaska. We talked with the Sukpiak. We went to um, the Kenai Pe Peninsula. We went back to Kayukit in that area and spoke to the Hautwith, the hereditary leaders. We told them the kinds of things that we'd learned through um, the different research and the observations that we'd been making over the past five years. And we did qualitative, quantitative surveys um, in um, Kayukit, uh, the young woman in the purple jacket is Jen, uh, Jen Burt, and she uh, spent extra time there working with the individuals in the community and, and really doing an amazing job of gathering the information um, of the people's feelings, um, thoughts on what was happening to their world. So, what factors enable your ability to adapt the otters? So this was part of Jen's um, survey. So I'll let Anne take over. Yeah, so just as Barb said, this was the main question we asked. And we asked it with a quantitative survey and a Likert scale. And basically the green numbers uh, would be identified if a certain condition facilitated adaptation to sea otters and the red if they uh, constrained people's ability to adapt to sea otters. And so we asked about all sorts of things from tourism to federal regulations. In fact, we asked about 22 different conditions and here you're seeing them all and I don't want you to focus in the detail. I'm going to highlight the high points for you. So. Here for the Cayucat and the Sukpiak, what you're looking at are those bars representing the general trend in the data. The green bean helps to enable, red bean actually constrains. And the blue that is popping out are the top seven things that actually enable and constrain adaptation to sea otters. And I'm now going to draw those out so you can see them. So what are the seven key factors that enable adaptation? According to, to the, those communities, it was integrating traditional knowledge and stewardship into contemporary management. According to Pat, the greater knowledge we have of traditional values and cultural roles helps us ab um, better able to adapt to change. And otter management plans. So many of these nations actually have draft management plans, ones that are created locally and co-created, not just created for people in these communities. Um, people also identified more Indigenous authority and power in decision making. Increased knowledge on traditional use and management of sea otters. Experimenting with different management strategies like um, spatial allocations of hunts or even things like the restoration of ancient clam gardens and octopus gardens, um, the, the, uh, the, the initiation of kelp harvest, um, 
whole diversity of other kind of experimental management could, that could be associated with uh, enabling adaptation with sea otters. And learning from other otter impacted communities. But it was this one that rose to the top, and this was federal regulations that permit Indigenous people to hunt otters. So in Cayucat and Canada, local people, given our Species at Risk Act and given our Oceans Act, are very constrained in their ability to hunt. That's not the case in Alaska and the Sukupiak. They actually found that federal regulations enabled them to better adapt to sea otters. And that's because many of you know that Alaska natives are excluded from the Marine Mammal Act. So Tim Malchoff said, hunting is keeping our traditions alive. That's what's important. That's what we survived on. It's how we adapted. Okay, now we have our final wrap up sticking points, but I just wanna check, how are we doing for time? We have thumbs up. Oh, barb. Oh. Okay. So I'm doing my thesis on looking at climate change and how, how we can make a difference as um, small communities. And because we live around or in the Pacific Ocean and we consider ourselves ocean people, the fact that the ocean is getting warmer and being acidified at the same time is of great concern. And it impacts the food that we, we are able to um, get because a lot of things are not um, growing as they normally would. And so it's, it's another, another layer of things that you need to keep in mind. Um, I know that the blob, the warm blob that just happened a few years ago had um, huge impact. I, I spend my time on the water when I'm not at school and um, it's really important to, to note the, the um, kelp disappeared for us last year and we didn't have any this year. So the blob, um, as I said earlier, really impacted many things. The whales, the whales disappeared um, from our waters. They didn't show up in May as we usually expect them to happen. And uh, so the types of food that they're eating and the fact that they come from Hawaii to Haida Gwaii waters to, to start eating again um, was very scary when they didn't show up and there wasn't food. Our storms are getting bigger. This is my home. This is where I come from. And this, these pictures were taken in 2003. And the top, the top picture on the, on the left here, I hope it's the left, I'm feeling a really challenged this morning. Um, you can see that our, our museum um, has high tide, really high tide that day. And the pole on the left, that's my brother's pole. And you can see that the ocean has surrounded it. And the bottom, the bottom left is showing you what it looked like after it was finished. So we're dealing with this on, on um, not a regular basis, but it's, it's something that we have always in the backs of our minds. We've had, other, we've had other things that have happened. We've had waters that are water spouts um, move across our inlet in, in just seconds and have roofs pulled off our houses and things like that. So the concern um, of, of what's happening is real. And um, as I do my work with this, it, it, it shows us that we have lots of work to do as individuals. The IPCC projections are that our, our oceans are only going to get warmer. So I just wanted to show you, this is work by Lauren Weatherden and William Chung out at UBC. And what they've done is they've projected with a model what will happen to various fisheries in the next 50 years. And in yellow, you're seeing uh, the percent decline 
in fisheries given a high emission scenario and in blue a low emission scenario and each circle here represents a different fishery and what I'll just point out to for example the top left one is Pacific herring Pacific herring is projected to decline by 49 percent in by 2050 with a high emission scenario uh, low emission scenario decline in 28 percent Okay, and, and you're seeing in here Pacific halibut, rockfish, um, intertidal clams. And if you look at these numbers, you can see they all have negative signs associated with them. So when it comes to thinking about sea otters coming to an area influencing directly shellfish, the other major factor that's influencing shellfish, of course, is climate change through ocean warming and acid acidification. So when we're looking at what can we do, I think that it's really important for us to uh, integrate our knowledge with the traditional knowledge of the territory that you live within and where you're planning to do your work. In Haida Gwaii, our deep time laws um, were created so that we could live respectfully with all other creatures is we realize that as, as people, we're no better or no worse than, than the other creatures that are in our world. And we need to go back to respecting our territories and looking after them as we would look after our mom or our dad, because that is what Mother Earth does for us. She provides for us. And so we need, to, we need to think about how our laws that have been created, how they can be more respectful of all parts of our world and are it all inclusive instead of exclusive. So Haida laws come with a bunch of words and the, the biggest one for me is la gu ga hang fu, which means on your shoulders. It's on your shoulders for responsibility. Yahkudang is about respect. And kul yahta is the way to make things right if you, in, in our way, if I insult Anne or I break something that's of value to her, I have a responsibility to make things right with her. And so I would speak with Anne or Anne's family, and we'd agree on what would be um, the right way to make things right for her. And all these words that are underneath would be part of how we would make things right. And at the bottom, um, number 10 is the potlatch. And the reason I bring the potlatch up is because that was the final step in our actions when we were making things right between clans or between nations or um, things that we'd done wrong, whether it was um, a person or, or a thing. And so potlatch, contrary to the beliefs of the first people that came here, was not about just being frivolous and, and um, giving away everything. The, what people call gifts were actually payment for witnessing. And so I just wanted to drop in a little bit of, of Haida tradition and knowledge so that you understand a little better um, a law system that was never written in stone, that was malleable, that could support all kinds of daily living and show us how to live with the earth and with each other in a respectful way. So in Canada, we have several acts that right now are um, bumping up against each other and are influencing um, how we're going to make decisions about what to do with the recovery of sea otters. Uh, here's a quote from Natalie Jack. I believe there's more than one factor that stops us from coexisting with the otter. 
And that's our no consultation with our people by the federal government and the responsibility that has been taking, taken from us as a people. So right now, the issues of um, authority and decision making and the, the legal milieu where this is all happening is coming to a head in Canada. But we really see a window of opportunity um, and we're really optimistic. And that's because right now, particularly in British Columbia, First Nations are making some of the biggest conservation gains in our, um, marine systems on our coast through various initiatives. We can talk about them later. Federally, our federal liberal government um, is really supporting reconciliation with Indigenous communities that, as Barb said, have uns uh, the territories are unceded. They have a constitutional right to fisheries before recreational and commercial fisheries. So there's a real shift happening in Canada, and I'd say particularly in BC, in terms of people's social norms and values for, uh, towards conservation and Indigenous um, leadership and co-management of natural resources and ecosystems in British Columbia. And finally, Canada signed the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So we are now beholden to that international declaration. So right now, there's a lot of opportunity to make very positive change for humans and for sea otters and for coastal systems on our, on our coasts in BC. And we hope that you can do that here too. And with that, we'll just leave you with kind of five parting thoughts I thought of last night, really late when we got here. If we're gonna navigate towards ecologically sustainable and socially just operating space for sea otters, what do we need to do? We need to account for direct and indirect effects. Those indirect effects are really important, don't forget them and context-dependent effects. What happens in Alaska does not always happen in BC. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. You can ask them about that later. We need to consider immediately humans as part of systems. We need to incorporate local knowledge. There is a depth of millennia of understanding of, of the systems here, not only in terms of natural history, but in terms of management and stewardship. And we need to recognize, as uncomfortable as it may be for a bunch of marine conservationists, we need to really think about social justice as a dual and equally important goal. With that. So Hawa, thank you very much for listening to us. And we hope that you'll have questions and we hope you'll have some takeaways that'll help you as you make your decisions on what you're going to do next. Hawa.